Hello everyone, my name is Nora Katz, and I'm the Director of Heritage and Interpretation at the Institute of Southern Jewish Life. Welcome to this very special episode of the ISJL Virtual Vacation, featuring poet Elisheva Fox. Elisheva's debut poetry collection, Spellbook for the Sabbath Queen, is out now from Bell Point Press, and I had the opportunity to talk with her in depth about her work. This is such a special book. It tells a uniquely Southern and Jewish story of being Jewish in East Texas along the Gulf of Mexico. Elisheva's work is closely tied to being a late blooming queer person who isn't yet able to be out of the closet. The book is intensely personal and intimate, and it also has a lot to teach all of us about identity, memory, and home. I am so excited to share this with you. Enjoy my conversation with Elisheva Fox. I'm hoping just to start that you can sort of introduce us to your work. Like, how would you describe your work as a poet? What a great question, because I think I'm so accustomed to thinking about like the individual poems and thinking about like the individual words and the individual lines that like taking a step back and doing a forest view instead of a tree view is kind of an interesting challenge. And I, I think... The biggest thing for me that I realized after I had written the bulk of the book is that I'm very much a creature of place. Um, I, you know, I went to college, reluctantly stayed in my home state, didn't think that I was quintessentially Texan or a Gulf Coast denizen in any way. And I, I think the book really helped me realize how much growing up Jewish on the Gulf Coast has shaped the way I see everything. Um, So it's sort of a love letter to a smaller community um, and a look at the ways in which those things shape us for the better and also create gaps where less desirable things can happen. I want to come back to the the question of place, because I feel like that's so central in the whole project. But I just sort of, I would love for you to sort of introduce us to the book, to Spellbook for the Sabbath Queen, and sort of talking about like how it came to be and sort of what your inspiration for it was. So the whole book started with one poem. Um, right when the pandemic started and I was driving into Austin to get groceries, like pick up, um, cause we were at, uh, like my, my, my family has like a small farm just outside of Austin and that's where we fled to, um, when everything shut down and the, the first poem in the book or the first written poem in the book is unsigned. Um, and it was because I'd had some distance and separation kind of from my husband um, at that point, because the kids and I had gone to the farm and he had stayed. And it was just a reflection on how much more comfortable I was when he wasn't there. Um, and it it that poem happened very, very quickly. And then they all came after that. That was the first domino to fall, I guess. And then it the book was written very quickly. I think it's like a year's worth of poems, maybe, um, possibly less. And the title, you know, we grew up in the South and we hear all about beauty queens and beauty pageants. And and then we have our own context for that. We have the Sabbath queen on Friday. And in college, one of my favorite memories is going to Hillel on Friday night and everybody is singing La Chadori and and talking about the Sabbath Queen and the phrasing just feels really Southern to me, even though it is not, it is decidedly Jewish. Um, but there's something kind of like beauty queen about it. And I really love that. And then also I have kind of like a Mary Oliver-esque appreciation bordering on faith in nature. Um, and so Spellbook fit It also reminds me of like, I'm sure a lot of people listening will know like the cookbooks that our mothers had and our grandmothers had where it's yellowed and and all the recipes say like Mrs. Milton Goldsmith, right? Like it's 
the women don't even have their own names in them. It'll be like a cornbread recipe attributed to the wife of a man. And so I kind of wanted to use that framing and then reclaim it in a way that felt for us. Um, and I don't think I realized like as I was writing the individual poems, and that's why it's so nice to kind of do this forest view and then go back to the trees is that there are things that go through all of them, like language that is woven through all of them and imagery that's woven through all of them. And so it really was not as hard as I think it probably should have been to make it a coherent one, like holistic thing. Um, and again, I was shocked at going back and rereading it, just how Southern um, everything is. Like I think cast iron as a whole could be a whole chapter of, of imagery that I use um, later in the book. It was really became a project about grounding myself. Um, and it started in the pandemic when it was like, okay, if all of what I think is my life is gone, like all the domestic duties, all the shuttling to extracurriculars, all the, you know, the checking the boxes, then like, who am I? And that's what came out. What a good answer to that question. I would love to have you read for the book if you'd like to. I can absolutely do that. But I think since because we just talked about it, let me go find um, unsigned. Yes, I was going to say, because you've mentioned it and that was like the, the uh, catalyst almost. Unsigned. She watches him put away dinner, chicken breast, pale and saltless. He and his family cannot abide fat or skin or bones and challah and purple wine. He is a good husband, she says, her eyes a bit watery, her knuckles the same color as the chicken. He treats you like priceless art. Yes, well, it is a terrible exhausting thing to be Magritte's horse, useful parts, the head, the sufficient hips, on display and the rest ravaged by unfeeling trees. We were talking a little bit before we started recording about like the ways that your work is connected to like being Southern and Jewish. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how how those two things sort of play together in, in your work. So I grew up in an interfaith family. I made an affirmative decision um, to, it, depending on to whom you speak, either convert or kind of, you know, confirm my Jewishness. Um, Cause I appreciate that there are different and distinct views on who is Jewish. And that could be a whole other four hour interview with someone. And I'm not going to do that to you. Um, and but I grew up doing everything, which I think really congealed as a balance between a, a very Southern, like East Texas, Gulf Coast identity and Judaism. So, um, you know, we do, I do fried green tomatoes for Hanukkah because oil, but also fried green tomatoes are fantastic. Um, and I do fried cornbread for Hanukkah. And my mom, who is not Jewish, is the best cook in the family. And her matzo balls are identified as the most healing and soothing and delicious in the entire family. Um, you know, I'm very accustomed to the balance between, particularly with spring right around the corner, like Passover and Easter and going together. And, and you know, it, it also manifests as, for me as code switching, which I think a lot of us will understand and appreciate that when you are in other parts of the South where it's not as comfortable to be openly Jewish, that you, it's very easy for me to sound like I'm not because I grew up surrounded by not. Um, but it, it manifests in the food. I think it manifests in the way we view the seasons. Like we have a very seasonal calendar, Jewishly. Um, but we don't have seasons down here. Like we have even fewer seasons than y'all do in Mississippi. Like we have 100 degrees and 100% humidity 
And then we have 80 degrees and 100% humidity. And then we get a couple months of like what might be fall or winter. And then we go back to 80 degrees and 100% humidity. So the way that you identify seasons here is more the food and um, the words. You can't use nature as much when you're kind of grounding yourself in your praxis. Like we're, we're all sweating through whatever we're wearing on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, particularly when it's an early year. Um, and that is manifest for sure concretely in several of the poems. Like I think of Vinu Malkenu, um, 57, 60 something, I can't remember what year, um, like references hurricanes and references that, you know, our high holidays Jewishly occur during a season here where there is particularly post 2017 significant fear and awe of nature um, and appropriate horror over what we have done to make her angry. Um, Harvey for sure figures in into my imagery and into the way that I conceive of both climate change, having seen it personally, and then also identifying with like Noah and Nama. And now I know what that flood must have looked like. I have driven by, you know, freeways that are under 30 feet of water because they're designed to drain and, but not that much. Um, and so it connects me to them, I think, in a way that I wouldn't have if I weren't from the South and hadn't experienced like a Hurricane Harvey type event um, and and appreciating what it must have felt like for the raven to fly away and never come back and thinking you're never going to see the sun um, and how uncomfortably exciting it would be to see the dove come back um, when we see the water go away. But then you have to pick up the pieces and it will take, it took a long time for Houston to feel normal again. Um, and I think a lot of Houstonians would tell you, we all have kind of like a collective PTSD post Harvey when it starts to rain for too long um, or there's a hurricane in the Gulf and it swings just East of us and takes out its rage on new Orleans or, or Louisiana or Lake Charles. And it's, horrible, but we're also all like, it's a horrible sigh of relief because um, someone else is suffering. And, and these are connections between Judaism and lived experience that I think you wouldn't get anywhere else. As I was reading, I was finding all of, of course, all of these themes that you talk about repeating so much. And one of them was climate change. And one of the lines that I like wrote down to refer back to was from your poem Nama of I brought my sons into a world that will need an ark, which just like, oh, but it but it's right. Like I, I, I adore my children. Um, I only want them to live a, a life that is healthy. Right. But it's really hard sometimes um, to sit in the dark and say, I brought you into a world that I'm not entirely sure is going to survive um, in the ways that I want it to for them. And so it's it's not a, a far away win down here. It's now. Like it is right in front of us. Um, and I really don't want them to have to have an arc and I don't want them to suffer the disappointment of a rain raven flying away. And but I also can't promise them that that's not gonna happen. It's, it's, it's our reality. Um, and I, I, I also think that being Southern and being Jewish is a different perspective on climate change and a more immediate one, um, because we're right here and the water in the Gulf is very warm and we know it because we can feel it. I also wanted to ask you about the way that motherhood and the way that your children kind of play such such important roles in this book. You, there's a moment where you're like peeling an orange for them. That's like a really beautiful moment and driving to see the snow and. Which we did, we definitely, we did do this. Well, I always peel oranges for them, but the snow thing 
very much happened. We, I decided it was never going to happen again, that much snow. Um, and I wish that that were not the case. It did used to snow down here. You'd get it every three or four years. And now it's, you know, maybe that will be the only time they see that much snow in Texas. Um, and so we, I loaded them in the car and we skipped school and we drove to central Texas, which is where my, my parents' little farm is and stayed there and watched it snow like six inches, which is an insane amount for here. Um, and I, the thing that comes through to me about my kids when I'm reading the book again is that they have so much to teach me. Um, and all kids have things to teach adults. And I am grateful to be parenting in a time where that philosophy is not just laughed out of town, that children are individuals worthy of respect and worthy of being listened to and considered as real humans who have real feelings and real identities that are independent of their parents. Um, and, you know, I have very good parents whom I love very, very much, but we were also a family that was a product of the nineties. So my uncle died in 1992, I think from AIDS. And I remember my mom saying, you know, that was because of lifestyle choices, which as an unknowing queer kid, you squirrel away as that is a bad thing. Whatever, whatever that is, is bad. Um, and it, that's not knocking my mother or my father at all, but it very much informs the way that I parent. And so I want to expose my children to the vocabulary that they need to describe their internal experiences, because I think that that's really critical to them knowing who they are. And as the world gets weirder and weirder, every day, that's going to be the, the anchor for their arc is going to be knowing who they are. Um, and my job is to shut up and listen and let them tell me who they are, not for me to tell them who they are. Um, so I think there are two or three poems that really came out of something that one of my kids said to me where I was like, I need to sit down with this. This is, this is, um, profound on a level that is, beyond me. And so I need to kind of figure out what it means. Um, but yeah, I think, I think kids can teach us a lot. And I know like Pierre Kayaba tells us like, find a friend and find a teacher. And sometimes the teacher is nine or six. Um, and that's okay. I, I think one of the things that I appreciated so much in reading the book is that, um, it feels like just sort of like being invited inside of your brain in such a specific way. I'm so sorry. It's very cluttered um, in a delightful way, but um, thank you. That it's trying to get rid of the filter that we all have, right? Like in the, like the buffer and like, this is the Instagram version of my life. And it's like, no, it's, it's really messy and, um, and chaotic and, but also completely true to who I am in all the ways um, because we're all very multifaceted. Um, and it was fun really seeing like the parts of me that are really fundamental um, to the way that I see the world. And that is the Jewish part of me and the, the Southern part of me and the, the mom part of me and the, the late identifying because I lacked the vocabulary queer part of me. Um, and I think there are a lot of women in particular in my age bracket where we're kind of in the South, I think the, we lag a little bit down here as far as openness to alternative, not even alternative, just like not the accepted norm. Um, anything. And so women my age, there's an entire cohort of us where, you know, we went into the pandemic and whether it was TikTok or scrolling the internet or really sitting in our feelings because we're no longer 
focused on the to-do list and we're no longer focused on the utility and we're no longer focused on the roles to really sit down and say like, oh no, um, I am not who I thought I was. And that's amazing because your whole life, there's a sense of something not fitting. And, and it's very easy as a Southern Jewish person to say, well, it's just because I'm, I'm a religious minority. Like that's why I feel slightly out of place always. Um, it's because I'm not doing Christmas and yeah, I'm in the children's choir and I know the lyrics to every Christmas song ever. And also Jews wrote half of them, but really at the end of the day, like that's probably why I don't feel quite right or settled. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm different in that way. And then to realize that's not what it was. It's that, um, I'm queer and there was a piece to looking back at my life and being like, oh my God, all the rainbow flags, like they go back forever. It's, it's really something when you talk to people who come to queerness late and the happiness and joy of like, okay, now I'm me, now I get it. What you do from there with it, I think is very different individual to individual, um, but the, the absolute radiant comfort of identifying the thing that was keeping you from feeling whole um, has been really, really wild in the best way, in the best way. I wanted to ask you, I think more about, um, I think the way that you talk about like coming to realizations about your sexuality and then sort of like the decisions you're making based on that is, is I think really profound. And I feel like you strike such an interesting balance between sort of celebrating the joy of queerness and then also sort of talking about longing and talking about, you know, the ways that, that you have to keep it hidden. And I'm wondering how you sort of balance those things. That particular balance is unique to me as an individual, and, but also I think for the queer community is really common. Like knowing who you are and celebrating who you are and like pride and, and like, damn it, we deserve it. But also there's always a bittersweet edge to it because there are always going to be people who hate us. Um, like what's going on right now in this country with trans rights is infuriating. And I don't have the vocabulary to express how angry it makes me that I have friends who have to think about leaving Texas. Um, I do have words. They all start, they're all four letters and none of them are appropriate for um, anything resembling a professional interview. Um, like, so I think the details of that balance, right, are unique to the individual. Um, and I, for me, it's once I figured that out about myself, like I couldn't, you can't unsee it. You can't. Um, and I don't want to. Like it has helped me feel so much more myself. Um, it was like once I was willing to look at it, my queerness or my sexuality or once I was willing to look at it, and I, there were obviously for decades, was unwilling to look at it, even though it was right here out of the corner of my eye. Just if I didn't think about it, if I didn't put myself in those positions, if I didn't, you know, give it a shape, then I was good. Um, and now it's like, I can't imagine not knowing um, because it is so fundamental. And I think everybody who is not normative in terms of sexuality, in terms of gender, in terms of, of expression, in terms of neurodivergence, like has that kind of, I want to celebrate who I am, both for me and so that other people can see the celebration and because joy helps normalize things. And also the recognition that like, it shouldn't be this hard. It shouldn't. One of my favorite poems in the book, among many, is um, the poem Chesed, um, 
thinking about when, you know, this, this part of your life might become public. I'm wondering if you can sort of talk about that, that poem a little bit. It's, you know, it's one of those things where it, I think it's become the new queerness for me, right? Where it's like, I don't want to, if I think about it too much, if it hurts too much, how long am I going to be able to stay um, where I think I need to be to do what is right for my kids? Um, because it does hurt. And I, I don't uh, love the choices that I feel like I have to make. Writing has helped me kind of take that longing, which I think could have slowly eaten away at me, um, and do something with it or identify, you know, if I'm feeling down or like I'm banging my head against the bars of the cage, like why? Um, is it normal life stuff or is it because like once you, you see these things about yourself and then making a choice not to let them out takes a lot of energy um, and it is an affirmative choice and it sometimes feels hypocritical and that is hard. Um, but again, like there are definitely a lot of people in my position where the choice is not just for us. If it were just me, then like in Zedek, which is toward the end of the book, like I would have flown away by now, but it's not just for me. Um, I have to make decisions that are best for my children first um, to keep them safe so that they um, have what they need to thrive in, in a world where they may need an arc. Um, and I, I do wonder like what it would be like to come out publicly to people in my life. Like what does that, what would that look like at my age? But I, I, I wonder how much self-reflection there would be on the part of, you know, people who, were well-meaning and by people i mean primarily people in my family who were well-meaning but did not expose me to a world where i had the vocabulary or the awareness to identify this part of myself sooner um and it is fascinating because you know after the book was written so recently um i have had reason to have conversations with my parents about vocabulary and exposing children to words so that they can describe their internal experience. And, and my parents' perspective on that has changed, um, which makes me really, really, really proud of them um, and gives me hope that one day when it is possible and appropriate and good for my children, for me to leave, that I will be able to come out. Um, that's the dream. And it's it's definitely a dream that informs like multiple pieces in the book. Um, but I I I love Chesed and I'm I would love to read it um, because again I think it's a piece that a lot of queer late bloomers will identify with, particularly in the South where we are just a little bit later to the game. Chesed. I will die one day. And when I do, the rainbows no longer contained by my ribs and sealed mouth will leak. I can think of a dozen people who offended will gasp, maybe even weep, and grieve for that secret that they were not trusted to keep. But will they think on the spotted fawn why she trembles in the long grass and from whose teeth she is hiding? I'd love to know about the title of that poem because I think a lot of your a lot of the poems in the book are named after like a particular Jewish value or concept you know you have the poem Kaddish and like the world stands upon three things and Hesed and um you kind of give all those things new meaning in the book so I'm wondering sort of where for this poem in particular you know where Hesed comes from as the title so there there are several of them scattered through that 
I, I had per- written for myself. I had done a series on the like major arcana of tarot cards because I am, I, I am a nineties child and I did grow up with the craft and, um, it is a paradigm that works for me in terms of like thinking through archetypes and how they manifest in our lives. Um, and then I was looking at those poems and I realized that there is a kind of a Jewish equivalent, right? And it's, it's Kabbalah, it's the tree of life, it's Sephirot. And so I started writing poems that felt like they fit the different parts of the tree. And this one, I think it's really interesting to me that this one stands out to you the most because it's it's not what people would consider like compassionate, benevolent kindness, right? This reflection on like, are you going to think about the ways in which you contributed to my hiding? Um, and it is very much a piece about forgiveness. Like it's not, I don't think there is malice or, and certainly I have no ill will toward my parents. Like, again, I think my parents are amazing, wonderful people. And that what they did with respect to what they thought was sheltering me was done out of love. And, and again, like my uncle passed away in the early nineties, like the AIDS um, plague, because that's what it is and was visited our larger family house. Um, So that's the framework under which my parents were operating that like it was a death sentence to be queer. Um, And so there's no hate at all. Um, It really is like what they did to protect me or what I believe that they did because won't actually speak for them, um, did come from loving me. Um, they did think it was a kindness. Um, it, it was a protective measure on their part. Um, ultimately, you know, I figured everything out, but there was a I think there is a love sometimes, not in every case, certainly not in every case. And I wouldn't apply that to every case at all, but I think there was a love in my case, um, in my parents trying to keep me from finding myself. Um, and as a parent now, I get it. I wouldn't, do it because I have firsthand experience of what that can do to a person. But I, I get the inclination. Um, and it's, it's just an overabundance of love, of chesed. You talked a little bit about tarot just now in the book, like you're pulling from Jewish tradition and tarot and you're referencing like Virginia Woolf and Sylvia Plath. And I'm wondering sort of how you would characterize like your inspirations and your influences like what are the places that you're pulling from in your work it's fun because i would say something like oh it's like the craft meets fiddler on the roof (laughs) um you know 10 things i hate about you um which is a seminal movie for me for so many reasons um it's it's again like i'm tied to place i'm tied to the things i grew up with and tarot and wicca and the craft were huge parts of my middle school experience um and i i i really enjoy tarot cards for the same reason that i enjoy like the tree of life the sephirot um not because they tell the future although that would be great um but because they are archetypes through which you can anchor what you are feeling or experiencing. And it helps give words or a shape to stuff that can be really hard to talk about um, or to conceptualize. And that, and I, I, I think that they are more universal 
images and more universal tools than some of our more specific vocabulary. Um, but for me, I think they're interchangeable. And I think that there are ways to look at tarot as a very Jewish practice um, in terms of the ways that we tend to ground ourselves in our liturgy in you do the words and you do the practice and then the feeling has a space and a shape to move through um you know with the mitzvot with kashrut with shabbat with tahar tamishpacha like with all of it it is we're going to give you the form so that you can pour yourself into it and i think tarot is the exact same way um and so for me like it it moves together seamlessly it doesn't feel very disjointed i see those as part of the same paradigm for identifying emotion and processing emotion and framing it in a way that's digestible i love that a lot i'm i'm wondering um if there are any of the poems in the book that are like named after a tarot card that you wanted to share oh i there there are uh some of those are my favorites i will be honest i love the star actually and i think that's probably the one i'm going to read is the star the star in tarot is really about like the things that guide us and at the end of the day for me that has to be love like it has to be or else what am i doing what are any of us doing um and I, I think that's true for Judaism too, but it's interesting because it is not our version of love is, I think, different from our Christian neighbors. I think for us that love has to come with justice, like it has, those two things are inextricably tied together. Um, and that love for us also means wanting something to be the best version of itself. And so then you get the star. The star. Spring is here and the green grass draws deer down to the dawn highway. Does and antler stagged all alike in death, bones scattered as a graveled tracery of clouds. While overhead on warm wide wings between white ribs a dozen hot hearts spiral, spiral, spiral down over black branches that pink under sunlight fingers, and maybe I'll never tell you that I love you. Maybe I'll die with the words on my tongue and let a vulture carry them up. You've talked about this a little bit, but I'm I'm curious about, um, you know, people reading the book. It's not out in the world yet. When this comes out, it will be, I think on the day it goes out into the world. Um, I'm wondering, you know, what you hope people will will take away from it. I think it depends on who is reading it. Um, I think for people out there who find themselves in a position like mine, um, where you can't be your whole self, whatever that is, doesn't have to be sexuality, um, a sense of being seen because that's the hardest part of being in the closet, right? Is that no one sees all of you ever. Like you let your hand out because that's what somebody needs to see or, you know, you stick your foot out, but nobody ever gets to see all of you ever. And that is hard. Um, and I want people who exist in that place, which can be very dark, to know that they aren't alone. There are people out there who understand um, and who will be there waiting when they decide to open the door, if they get the chance. And if they don't, that's okay, because we still see them and we know they're there. And I think for people who are not personally in that position, um, kind of to understand what might lead you to landing yourself there. Um, that it's not as cut and dry as like, oh, I knew when I was 10 and I've always known that there are reasons that we hide from ourselves 
and to hold space for people like that because we're all figuring it out. Like we're all messing it up. Um, and then, you know, about the wonder of being a parent that kids are really, really wise um, in a way that I wish I could be a lot um, and am not. And also that, you know, whatever your situation, it's okay to love and be soft and be tender. And even if you can't show that to people, even if you have to keep it in your mouth and let a vulture carry it up to the sky, like someone somewhere is waiting for the love that you can give. Um, and it's not a waste ever to have an open heart. Is there anything that I haven't asked you about that you wanted to make sure to talk about? No, you've asked so many really good questions and like forced me to think. Um, I do want, I want to ask you a question though, what your favorite piece was from the whole book and why? Oh boy. I, there, I'm, I'm like looking at like what I was writing down, you know, because I feel like maybe that's telling. Um, I think, um, architect is one that I really loved. It's, I mean, it's, that's a sh very short one. Um, it is a very short one and I am happy to read it. Architect was one that I wrote in a moment of like, there's a, there's a, our faith tradition has so much dark humor in it, right? Like the, what's the joke would, what holiday is it? Is it a religious holiday or is it a, they tried to kill us, they failed. Now let's eat kind of thing, right? Like we, dark humor is how we make really hard things feel okay. We can't make them okay because they're not okay, but we make them feel okay. Um, and that is kind of the edge to architect where it's like, man, what would our lives have, like, what could we have accomplished? Um, if we, <laughs> if we hadn't married men. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to read this one because I love that this is your favorite. It is, it's a sleeper hit personally. It's <laughs> one of mine. Um, architect. Loose, laceless, I lean over you laughing and laughing. I look like the famous she-wolf and you lick your lips. Ask me, what cities could we have built together if we hadn't married men? I love that a lot. Thank you for the gift of reading it aloud. <laughs> no, I am happy to. And I am delighted that you, that you like that one because it, I think it's also really easy to get swept up in the hard and get swept up in the frustration and get swept up in the like, it hurts. It hurts not to spread your wings when you have to be quiet about who you are. And to have someone to laugh with about that, even if it's just one person, is critical, like critical. Um, and that's why community is so important. And I think that's why what ISJL does is like a mitzvah beyond mitzvah, because it's, it's the same sense of isolation that can slowly eat at, at you when you have no one to talk about these things with, whether it's your queerness or being closeted or parenting in a time where you're worried that your kids are not going to have a home to come back to because the Gulf of Mexico is going to swallow everything or anything like that, just to have somebody to make the, the dark jokes with can make it a little more bearable. Um, and I'm, I'm thrilled that this is the one that spoke to you because it, it, this one was another one that happened very quickly. Like there were no edits. It just came out like this because it was a hilarious image in my head. Um, and also like a kind of a callback to the first poem in the book where it's like, what would have happened if we had not just filled in the blanks with what we thought we were supposed to do? We could have conquered the world maybe. I love that. And I, I don't know, just reading the whole book, it, like you write about longing so profoundly and, um, it just feels like this very like raw 
and like sort of beautiful invitation into your brain. Um, and so it was just like a delight to, to read. Thank you so, so much. And thank you again for taking like the time to read it and to read it with care. Like that means more to me than I am able to articulate. Um, do you want to close us out with one more poem? I would love to. I think I'm going to close it out with the last poem in the book, um, which is another one of the the Kabbalistic titles. It's the last one. Um, so Malchut. How unlike the ocean I am, I have no depths that I hide from you. But when you are full flashing silver, I feel a growing greater swell. And when you fold yourself into the dark, I smooth out my hurricane waves and wait. Didn't you know? Everything holy is a circle in the end. Endless thanks to Elisheva Fox for sharing her work and her voice with us. Head to the ISJL Virtual Vacation website for a link to order your copy of Spellbook for the Sabbath Queen. If you are questioning your sexual orientation or gender identity or struggling with coming out, I hope you'll seek out resources from Sojourn, the Southern Jewish Resource Network for Gender and Sexual Diversity, Keshet for LGBTQ Equality in Jewish Life, Trans Lifeline, and The Trevor Project. All four organizations are linked in the description of this episode. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time for more stories from the Jewish South.